Tales of a Korean Grandmother 32 Traditional Tales from Korea by Francis Carpenter Chapter 4 Why the Dog and the Cat Are Not Friends One warm autumn afternoon, sounds of barking from the outer court drifted to the veranda where Octo was helping her grandmother sort pine seeds for the New Year cakes. I have a riddle for you, Hamoni, the, the little girl said. My ears are open, Jay Child, the old woman replied, smiling fondly down upon her favorite granddaughter. Here it is, then. Who in this house first goes forth to welcome the coming guests? Would it be your father, the master of our house? Hamani replied thoughtfully, pretending she had never heard this old riddle before. No, Hamani, it would not be a bougie. The master of this house greets his guests only when they have entered the outer court. Octo was delighted because her grandmother did not guess the answer at once. Would it be Pak, the gatekeeper? Hamani asked, wrinkling up her smooth, old, ivory-colored brow as if she were puzzled. Oh no, Hamani, should I tell you? Well, it is dog. To be sure, it is dog, the Korean grandmother nodded her dark head. Dog is the true gatekeeper of our house. Most of the day, and even at night, this shaggy shepherd, which everyone inside the Kim Courts called Dog, lay halfway through the dog hole cut in the bottom of the bamboo gate. With his head thrust through the opening, he was the first to see and give warning of approaching visitors. The dog took his duties as, gate as gatekeeper much more seriously than old Pack, who slept most of the time in the door of the servants' house, just inside the gate. Of course, now and then he went out into the street to hunt bits of food that might have been thrown out there by the neighbors, or he sometimes left his post to bark at a bird or to chase a stray cat. It was this last pastime that brought Dog now racing through the middle gate into the inner court. Around the tall pottery water jars went the black cat with the brown t dog at her tail. Over and under the seesaw they flew, and into the corner where Yang Tu and his cousins were busy making kites with the New Year flying. Worry, worry, Dog, come here, Yang Tu called severely. And the boy joined in the chase, finally catching the excited Dog by the neck and holding him tight until the black cat got away to safety in the garden green gyms, beyond the women's houses. These children did not have much sympathy for the cat, but Yang Tu was afraid the animals might spoil his precious kite-making materials, which were spread out on the ground. The Kims liked the dog because he was such a good watchman, but he was in no way an indoor pet like the dogs of western lands. This black cat, which often crept over their wall, was very wild. Once Octo had tried to pet it, but the cat would only growl, spit at her, and scratch. Why do dogs and cats fight so, Helani? The little girl asked, looking up from her tray of pine seeds. My grandmother used to tell me a story about that, Helani said, and I'll tell it to you. Somehow, Yang Chu and his cousins must have guessed their grandmother was beginning a story. Before she was well started, they had brought their papers, their bamboo sticks, and their glue pots and set up their little kite factory at her feet. The dog and the cat in my tail lived in a small wine shop on the bank of a broad river beside a ferry, my children. Old Koo, the shopkeeper, had neither wife nor child. In his little hut, he lived by himself except for this dog and this cat. The tame beast never left his side. While he sold wine in the shop, the dog kept guard at the door and the cat caught mice in the storeroom. When he walked on the river bank, they trotted by his side. When he lay down to sleep upon the warm floor, they crept close to his back. They were good enough friends then, the dog and the cat, but that was before the disaster occurred and the cat behaved so badly. Old Koo was poor, but he was honest and kind. His shop was not like those where travelers are persuaded to drink and wine until they become drunk and roll on the ground. Only one kind of wine was sold, but it was a good wine. Once they tasted it, Koo's customers came back again and again to fill their long-necked wine bottles. Where does old Koo get so much wine? The neighbors used to ask one another. No new jars are ever delivered by bull carts at his door. He makes no wine himself, yet his black jug is never without wine to pour for his customers. No one knew the answer to the riddle save old Koo himself, and he told it to no one except his dog and his cat. Years before he opened his wine shop, Koo had worked on the ferry. 
One cold, rainy night, when the last fairy had returned, a strange traveler came to the gate of his hut. Honorable sir, he begged Ku, give me a drop of good wine to drive out the damp chill. My wine jug is almost empty, Ku told the traveler. I have only a little for my evening drink, but no doubt you need the wine far more than I. I'll share it with you. And he filled up a bowl for his strange, thirsty guest. The stranger, on leaving, put into the ferryman's hand a bit of bright golden amber. Keep this in your wine jug, he said, and it will always be full. Now, as old Ku told his dog and his cat, that traveler must have been a spirit from heaven, for when Ku looked at the black jug, it was heavy with wine. When he filled his bowl from it, he thought he had never tasted a drink so sweet and so rich. No matter how much he poured, the wine in the jug never grew less. Here was a treasure indeed. With a jug that never ran dry, he could open a wine shop. He would no longer have to go back and forth, back and forth, in the ferry boat over the river in all kinds of weather. All went well until one day when he was serving a traveler. Ku found his horror that his black jug was empty. He shook it and shook it, but no answering tinkle came from the from the hard amber charm that should have been inside. I go, I go, Ku wailed. I must unknowingly have poured the amber out into the bottle of one of my customers. I go, what, what shall I do? The dog and the cat shared their master's sadness. The dog howled at the moon, and the cat prowled around the shop, sniffing and sniffing from under the rice jars, and even high up on the rafters. These animals knew the secret of the magic wine jug, for the old man had often talked to them about the stranger's amber charm. I am sure I could find the charm, the cat said to the dog, if only I could catch its amber smell. We shall search for it together, the dog suggested. We shall go through each every house in the neighborhood. When you sniff it out, I will run home with it. So they began their quest. They asked all the cats and dogs they met for news of the lost amber. They prowled around all the houses, but not a trace could they find of their master's magic charm. We must try the other side of the river, the dog said at last. They will not let us ride across on the ferry boat, but when the winter cold comes and the river's stomach is solid, we can safely creep over the ice like everyone else. Thus it, wa thus it was that one winter morning, the dog and the cat crossed the river to the opposite side. As soon as the owners were not looking, they crept into the houses. The dog sniffed around the courtyards, and the cat even climbed up on the beams under the sloping grass roofs. Day after day, week after week, month after month, they searched and they searched, but with no success. Spring was at hand. The joyful fish in the river were bumping their backs against the soft ice. At last, one day, high up on the top of, the great, of a great brass-bound chest, the cat smelled the amber. But aye, the welcome perfume was, came from inside a tightly closed box. What could they do? If they pushed the box off the chest and let it break on the floor, the master of the house would surely be warned and chase them away. We must get help from the rats, the clever dog cried. They can gnaw a hole in the, the box for us and get the amber out. In return, we can promise to let them live in peace for ten years. This plan was all against the nature of a cat, but this one loved its master, and it consented. The rats consented, too. It seemed to them almost too good to be true that both the cats and the dogs might leave them alone for ten pe whole peaceful years. It took the rats many days to gnaw a hole in that box, but at last it was done. The cat tried to get at the amber with its soft paw, but the hole was too small. Finally, a young mouse had to be sent in through the wee hole. It succeeded in pulling the amber out with its teeth. How pleased our master will be! Now good luck will live again under his roof, the cat and the dog said to each other. In their joy at finding the lost amber charm, they ran around and around as if they were having fits. But how shall we get the amber back to the other side of the river? The cat cried in dismay. You know I cannot swim. We shall hold the amber safely inside your mouth, cat, the dog replied wisely. She'll climb on my back, and I'll swim you over the river. And so it happened. Clung the thick, shaggy hair of the dog's back, the cat kept its balance until they had almost reached their own bank on, of the stream. But there, playing along the shore, were a number of children, who burst into laughter when they saw the strange ferryman and his curious passenger. A cat riding on the back of a dog! Ho ho ho! They laughed, ha ha ha, ho ho ho! Just look at that! They called to their parents, and they came to laugh too. Now the faithful dog paid no attention to their foolish mirth, but the cat could not help joining them in the fun. 
it too began to laugh. From its open mouth, old Koo's precious amber charm dropped down upon the river bottom. The dog shook the cat off his back, he was so angry, and it was a miracle that the creature at last got safely to the shore. In a rage, the dog chased the cat, which finally took refuge in the crotch of a tree. There the cat shook the moisture out of its fur. By spitting and spitting, it got rid of the water it had swallowed while in the river. The cat dared not come down out of the tree until the angry dog had gone away. That, so my grandmother said, is why the dog and the cat are never friends, my dear ones. That is why, too, a cat always spits when a strange dog comes too near. That is why a cat does not like to get its feet wet. But what about the amber charm of poor old Koo? Octa asked anxiously. It was that dog who finally saved the fortunes of the old wine shop keeper, Helmani explained. First, he tried swimming out into the stream to look for the amber. But it was too deep for him to see the bottom. Then he sat beside the river fisherman, wishing he had a line or a net like theirs that would bring up the golden prize he sought. Suddenly, from a fish that had just been pulled out of the water, the dog sniffed an amber perfume. Grabbing that fish up in his mouth before the fisherman could stop him, he galloped off home. Well done, dog, said old Koo. There is only a little food left under our roof. This fish will make a good meal for you and me. The old man could open the fish, and to his surprise and delight, the bit of amber rolled out. Now I can put my magic charm back into the jug, Koo said to himself. But there must be at least a little wine in it to start the jug flowing again. While I go out to buy some, I'll just lock the ember up inside my clothes chest. When Koo came back with the wine and had opened the chest, he found that instead of one of the one suit he had stored in there, there were now two. Where his last string of cash had been, there were two strings. And he guessed that the secret of this amber charm was that it would double the whatever it touched. With this knowledge, Koo became rich beyond telling, and in the gate of his fine new house he got a dog hole for his faithful friend, who had saved him from starving. There, day and night, like our new, like our own four-footed gate guard, the fat dog lay watching in peace and well-fed contentment. But all through his life he never again killed a mouse, nor made a friend of a cat.